Yeah. Okay. Hello. Hello. Welcome back. Um, my name is Jonas Sandbrink. I'm a researcher at the Future of Humanity Institute, and it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, the two BioRisk speakers today. Welcome to BioRisk, uh, an introduction into global catastrophic biological risks. Uh, our two speakers are my amazing friends and colleagues, um, Janvi Ahuja. She is a research affiliate at uh, the Future of Humanity Institute and a DPhil student at the University of Oxford. She works on really exciting biosecurity issues, and uh, she also worked with the Biological Weapons Convention previously in Geneva. Simon Grimm is a final year medical student at the University of Basel, and he also interned previously with the um, United States, uh, United Nations, uh, <laughs> and the Biological <laughs> Weapons Convention. And uh, he's also doing some really interesting technical and policy work in the biosecurity space. I hope you guys enjoy the talk, and then we'll see each other later for the Q&A. To submit questions, you need to go onto the app, um, onto the BioRisk and Introduction event, and then there is a button with live discussion where you can then submit your questions. And then later, I'll uh, yeah, forward these to them, and we'll see what they have to say. So for now, enjoy the talk, and yeah. See you. <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, Jonas. Um, yeah, moving on to the next slide. Um, do you want to You want to? Editing the um, So just a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, first, we're going to address the question, why do we care? Um, uh, and then we're going to move on a little bit onto what do we do. So we're going to talk a little bit about interventions. Um, and then lastly, we're going to speak about um, how would you get involved uh, if you were interested in this kind of a thing. Just some preliminary remarks. Um, so we want to be clear about what this presentation is and what it is. Um, so this is very much uh, an overview of um, global catastrophic biological risks in such that it is an introduction. Um, it doesn't go super into depth in that it isn't comprehensive. It's very much a glance at some of the questions we look at, um, but it doesn't address sort of all the caveats um, as well as all of the questions um, that we look at. Um, something else to note is that this presentation isn't settled. Uh, a lot of our views may change uh, in the next few years. Um, and I think that's very good and important. Um, and lastly, and perhaps most importantly, um, it's important to note that this presentation isn't a guide for what you should definitely do with your life and your career. Um, uh, a lot of this presentation is based on empirical and normative assumptions that we're making. Um, and it's really important that you make uh, assessments for what sort of your um, yeah, sort of aligned uh, empirical and normative assumptions are uh, in this space. So moving on to a definition um, of what global catastrophic biological risks are. This is a pretty good broad definition by the Nuclear Threat Initiative. So it's biological risks um, of an unprecedented scale that have the potential to curtail the long-term potential of human civilization. Um, it's worth noting that we're going to be using the acronym GCBR, or the term Global Catastrophic Biological Risk, quite a bit in this presentation. Um, and if that starts to become annoying for you, feel free to substitute that with virus in your head. Um, but there is a reason that we're doing this. Um, and it's because a lot of uh, good work that's sort of under the umbrella of virus and biosecurity um, is quite different from specifically global catastrophic biological risk. To expand on this a little bit more, the things that we're really interested in are, um, um, are global catastrophic risks and existential risks. Um, so these are sort of um, really, really large scale events. Um, though these um, other sort of scenarios uh, uh, explained here um, are still really important, um, there's a lot of really, and there's a lot of really good work going into them, um, it's not the focus of this talk today and not the focus of our work. Um, we also note that like a lot of people here might be interested in existential risk in particular. Um, if you're interested in understanding the sort of relationship between biosecurity Biotechnology and Existential Risk. There's this really great talk from the AG 2017 titled Biotechnology and Existential Risk, which I'd recommend you looking into. Great, there we go. Cool. So next up, we want to look at the question of why we should actually care about this at all. And for this, it's just valuable to look at infectious disease in general. So infectious disease has always been part of humanity's past. Um, and one illustrative example 
for the impacts of infectious disease is the Black Death. In the 1300s, the Black Death killed about 150 to 200 million people. And thus was the largest pandemic in recorded history. Um, killing also about one third of all European populations. And we can now ask the question, is modern civilization more resilient or less resilient towards infectious disease? So there are some arguments in favor of modern civilization being more resilient because we have technology, we have vaccines, we have antivirals. But then also we are way more interconnected. Um, a case um, happening in France can like quickly be introduced into Latin America. And the, the example for why this is a question that um, yeah, is valuable to think about is um, obviously COVID-19. So COVID-19 killed about 6 million um, people and showed that the um, world is not prepared to face catastrophic pandemics. But moving on, we are in, although we also care about natural pandemics, we are particularly worried about um, pandemics caused by engineered pathogens. So an engineered pathogen is different from a normal pathogen because a normal pathogen um, has certain attributes, so transmissibility or virulence. And um, yeah, so you have these attributes um, and an engineered pandemic, an engineered pathogen can actually be optimized towards causing more damage and it can opt optimize towards metrics that evolution doesn't optimize for. And thus, an engineered pandemic can cause large-scale damage. And if, an, if some bioweapon year or um, a ro some scientist who doesn't pay attention releases such a pathogen, this could cause major damage. And if we believe that engineered pandemics are what we should really worry about, that we can then further think, okay, are risks from engineered pandemics increasing or decreasing? And there are some reasons to, to suggest that risks from engineered pandemics are increasing and thus GCBRs overall are increasing. And some trends that point towards this are first um, the overall quick advance of biotechnology. So for instance, um, the cost of sequencing a human genome has dropped by a factor of 100,000 in the last 20 years. And this capability enables us to sequence more and more, path uh, more, and more pathogens, also more and more organisms. And though this, useful, this knowledge is useful for a lot of applications, it can also be misused towards um, malicious ends. And then apart from incremental um, progress, there are also entirely new applications, such as AlphaFold, which allows the prediction of a protein structure based entirely on a sequence. And if then that knowledge is um, combined with inferring the um, function of a certain protein, again, this can be used for good, but it can also be used to deliberately engineer a pathogen to cause large-scale damage. And then if we look at these trends, all of them are converging to enable powerful new dual-use capabilities. So dual-use is this important term within biosecurity. And it means that a certain capability can be used for good. So if we know more about pathogens, we can deliver better vaccines, we can develop novel antivirals, but we can also um, develop pathogens, actual pathogens, and think about how to make pathogens more destructive. So if we believe that this argument is true, if we believe that pathogens, engineered pathogens, could cause large-scale damage, we can now cause, ask the question, okay, are people actually focusing on this? Is there enough effort um, address, um, focused on this question? And we believe that GCVRs overall are still neglected. There are two examples illustrating this. So first, you can have a look at American policy. So overall, the US is probably the country that should be best um, um, prepared against the pandemic. Um, so, for example, in the um, Health Security Index, which um, quantifies how well a country is prepared against pandemics, the US ranks at the top. But following the pandemic, um, we saw, for instance, that the White House released this paper um, called the American Pandem Pandemic Preparedness Plan. And this argued in favor of allocating 65 billion towards pandemic pre 
prevention and pandemic preparedness. But this um, proposal wasn't taken up in discussions within the Senate or the House of Representatives. And by now, we are at a proposal called the Prevent Pandemics, Prevent Pandemics Act. And that allocates only 1.6 billion towards pandemic preparedness, which is a minuscule amount given the economic and human tragedy of COVID-19. And then if we look at biological weapons um, more precisely, we can then hope that the Biological Weapons Convention is actually um, capable of stopping the use of biological weapons. But again here, first, the biological weapons is severely understaffed, so it has five staff, while the OPCW has 500. So the OPCW focuses on the implementation of the Chemical Weapons Convention. And then furthermore, the BWC has no me mechanism to actually assess compliance. So as of now, states, parties, or nations could have biological weapons programs, and we have, on the entire globe, we have no mechanism to assess if countries are in breach of the BWC. So we, if, you, if you buy this argument that GCBRs are neglected, we can now think about what to do about them. Yeah, what do we do about them? Um, so there's one way to assess biological risks, and this might be thinking about um, whether the source of them is sort of deliberate or non-deliberate. When we think about um, non-deliberate sources or non-deliberate release, uh, we might think of spillovers. So these are zoonotic spillovers. This is something that happens as a consequence of our interactions with animals. So this can be um, interactions with wild animals, or this can be interactions with sort of farm animals. Um, and uh, examples of pathogens that you may know uh, or diseases you may know are Ebola virus disease uh, and influenza sort of originated in, in animals um, and then sort of uh, jumped over from them to us. Um, and then another example of a non-deliberate emergence is accidental. So this can be a laboratory accident. Um, an example of this is um, uh, the uh, anthrax um, release in the Soviet Union. Um, this happened in a small town where, um, because of bad ventilation uh, within, the, uh, within a laboratory, um, anthrax samples were released into the air and then were taken downwind um, and unfortunately infected many people and killed 68. So this is not something that doesn't have precedence. Laboratory accidents do very much happen. Um, and then some, another category of this is transportation accidents. Um, and this is definitely of worry, um, but something else that we uh, also think about, that we're concerned about, are uh, deliberate uh, sort of emergence uh, of pathogens and disease. When we think about deliberate emergence, we might think about state actors and non-state actors. So state actors are governments. Non-state actors can be lone wolves, so these are people acting completely independently. Um, they might be rogue actors, so people who usually operate within organizations such as government or academia, but are acting very independently of these organizations um, to sort of do deliberate misuse, and then they may also be groups. Um, so um, I'd just like to say that all risk doesn't stand equal. Um, you might have been thinking a little bit more about sort of natural um, emergence of pandemics whilst I was speaking about this, but as Simon mentioned earlier, the situations that we're really concerned about um, are engineered uh, pandemics. Um, and just to expand a little bit more on why this is the case, um, there's a sort of natural trade over with natural pandemics where um, uh, there's this trade-off between virulence and transmissibility, um, but with engineered pathogens, this doesn't necessarily have to be the case. It's also crucial to remember that um, natural, natural pathogens are not optimizing um, to sort of kill humans um, or, or kill large proportions of the populations, but an actor could be. Um, and so it's really scary to think about um, what a deliberately engineered uh, pathogen could do. Um, and that's why it is sort of colored in red here to show that we're the most concerned about this kind of a thing. Cool. So if we know about those actors and if you know about um, what kind of um, sources pathogens could come from, we can, for instance, design certain mechanisms that prevent um, some source um, to actually, yeah, or some actor to cause a pandemic. Um, but let's say we fail to prevent an outbreak from happening. Then we have several other ways to intervene. So the first thing would be to detect a novel pathogen. 
So overall, within outbreaks, it's exponentially more easy to contain an outbreak if we detect it more quickly. So this is something we are actually working on within GCBR biosecurity to enable novel detection technologies. And then let's say we detect a novel pathogen. We can then try to contain it. And to having like, very robust containment capabilities is really important because this enables us to stop this curve from going up here and um, reaching the level of a GCBR or even potentially leading to extinction. If you now look um, further at detection, there are two central capabilities that we are quite excited by. So the first one is wastewater sequencing, wastewater surveillance. And this would enable way earlier detection than the one we're currently having. So as of now, if there, if there would be a novel pandemic, the thing we can hope for is that some infectious disease doctor somewhere thinks, okay, this looks suspicious. Um, I've tried like several different kinds of PCRs on this and no, nothing comes up. And then like after some time, he actually has the sample sequenced. But what we, what we could have instead is to have continuous monitoring of wastewaters, um, looking for any exponentially rising sequence, and then like looking at that sequence in detail and thinking about, okay, could this be a pathogen, or could this even be an engineered pathogen? And this very early detection would then allow us to actually contain that um, outbreak before there are even any hospital hospitalizations. But if there are hospitalizations, we can then use clinical metagenomics. So clinical metagenomics also have like a similar, this um, equal advantage of being pathogen agnostic. So being able to detect any pathogen without us having to know in advance what pathogen could cause the disease. And now let's say we detected a novel pathogen, we detected a novel outbreak. What are then capabilities that would help us in containing or containing an outbreak or making us resilient against the worst case outbreak. There, the first thing we can look at are, is improved ventilation. So ventilation was shown to be really important in the current pandemic because um, the um, pathogens we focus on the most are respiratory pathogens and thus having really good ventilation suppresses um, the spread and thus um, helps us in like having a Path, um, an outbreak not become a pandemic. And a further capability that people within GCBR biosecurity are thinking about are so-called pandemic refuges. This would help us in, in the face of a worst case GCBR that could potentially pose an existential risk. There would, um, it would be a great advantage to have pandemic refuges where people can shelter in and um, make sure make sure that even in a, in a worst case scenario, humanity will be resilient. And then lastly, um, something more um, in a way mundane and something we all like appreciate by now is to have vaccines in under 100 days. So there are a couple different, th couple different things that would help here. First is to have very robust um, platform technologies that could lead to the de quick development of a novel vaccine. And then the other thing that would be really useful is to have policies that enable the quick authorization of a vaccine, which took, um, in, the, in the eyes of many in the GCBR biosecurity space, way too long in the current pandemic. Cool. So in sum? Yeah, just to summarize some of the interventions we were speaking about, um, I'm going to try, like, uh, describe some broad categories uh, under each of the sort of prevention detection and containment. Um, so within prevention, uh, um, we've spoken about a little bit about uh, promoting responsible life sciences when we mentioned uh, dual use research. Um, another aspect of that is strengthening biosafety, um, so making it so that labor uh, laboratory accidents don't happen. Um, but something we haven't spoke about very much is differential technology development. Um, so some of you may know this uh, idea, but uh, essentially what it entails is ensuring that um, Dangerous, it's sort of trying to change the order in which technology is developed uh, and ensuring that technologies that can safeguard um, our sort of um, safety uh, are developed uh, prior to dangerous technologies um, that could harm it. Um, and this is done through sort of policy work um, and an understanding and, uh, of what technologies 
are particularly harmful or in the future could pose harm. Uh, and then lastly, there's this concept of deterrence. So um, deterrence is trying to make using biological weapons um, not an option or something that is an unappealing option for um, the actors that we maybe spoke about earlier. Um, there's also this concept of deterrence by denial, which is sorry, very, sort of very proximal to this. Um, and it's certainly one of the ways that I think about um, sort of uh, biosecurity as a whole, which is trying to um, make the bar for using biological weapons so high um, that nobody wants to use this. I, I guess like what's different about this is that um, maybe we don't think that we can remove all bio risks from the world ever. Uh, maybe we think that it's very difficult uh, to ensure that no one ever becomes sick. Um, but something that we can do is uh, make the bar for using a kind of dangerous weapon so high that it's not used and it doesn't become catastrophic. Okay, moving on to detection. Uh, we spoke a lot about sort of developing robust early warning systems. Um, now, robust is like an interesting word here. Um, one idea in terms of implementing an early warning system that is sort of really holistic um, is this idea of layered defense. So um, environmental metagenomics and clinical metagenomics or surveillance in these systems can also be aided by things like sentinel um, metagenomics and uh, surveillance. And this means really targeting groups that we're worried about, so people who are working in high-risk laboratories, uh, and making sure that um, if we don't catch people at one level, so if we miss an outbreak at uh, an environmental surveillance level, uh, that we then catch them at clinical, and if we miss them there, we catch them at sentinel or something like that, which is sort of really holistic um, and, and covers uh, us on all bases. And then lastly, there's containment. Um, Simon spoke a little bit about the non-pharmaceutical interventions, and this is something that we've all experienced. These are things like lockdowns and travel bans um, and uh, medical countermeasures like vaccines. There's also sort of therapeutics. Um, and yeah, something to note here that development is really important, and it's important that we do this sort of in peacetime or before the pathogen uh, comes to be, that we think of these sort of platform technologies. But deployment is also very, very crucial. Um, and then lastly, using refuges. Um, yeah, to change. And th this is sort of like some of the stuff that we've worked on, we work on, we've highlighted. Um, and yeah, uh, that kind of leads me on to the next slide. Uh, we just wanted to share some examples of our current work and, and work that we've done. So this is a little bit Future of Humanity Institute centric, but um, some of the work <laughs> that we have done um, has been research in public health um, and other type of technical research. So um, there's been some research in um, vaccines. Um, we've also done uh, work in poli policy advocacy and governance. So work at the Biological Weapons Convention and sort of adjacent to it, particularly interested in sort of verification mechanisms um, and assessing compliance and how we can make that a reality. Um, yeah, also work in dual use risks and sort of where, the, where to dry, uh, draw the line between what work is too dangerous and what work uh, should be done. And then lastly, things like this, community building and, and network building. And um, uh, we are also developing a fellowship with the Cambridge Existential Risk Initiative, um, which is a sort of a very in-depth sort of uh, introduction into uh, biosecurity, um, which should be available on their website soon. Cool. Um, so let's say you want to get involved in this. Um, so we are very excited if you, if you want to get involved, obviously. But there are, first off, a few things to consider about getting involved. So first you should ask yourself the question, should you get involved, given your background, given your attributes? So the first thing is just to think about personal fit. So this is partly um, the question of, um, yeah, do you have like the right background? Have you studied like the right subjects? Biosecurity is currently growing quickly and we need people from more and more backgrounds, but it's still like a valuable question to ask yourself if your um, if your fit is particularly suited to biosecurity. And then next up, there are several, several um, desirable qualities people within biosecurity should have. So the first one would be discretion. So within biosecurity, we deal with certain information that shouldn't be released to the um, wider public because it could potentially be used to harm others. And then next up, um, one really crucial fact about the biosecurity work we're um, focusing on is that it really prioritizes worst case scenarios. So this is large swath of biosecurity work, but only a small amount of people that focus on the worst case risks. 
And if you want to work on this, if you want to like contribute towards lowering GCBRs, um, it's really important that you focus on these risks. And then lastly, you should be open to doing interdisciplinary work. So I think this is one of the aspects that makes this field really fun, but it's also something you, yeah, you need to be prepared for. So I mean, we both have done some um, policy work. We are both doing some technical work. Yeah, this is just like something you need to be able to do. Cool. Great. Um, now I think there's like two kinds of ways you can think about getting biosecurity. That's uh, explicit and implicit. So something we wanted to flag is that um, many of you here might be thinking of some of the more explicit ways, and this is sort of like explicitly long-termist biosecurity. Um, and this might be things like working at um, uh, working on projects that have to do with um, existential risk as a consequence of sort of um, uh, biological risks. It might be things like networking at EAGs like this, um, or it might be working at organizations that. Um, yeah, sort of have this explicit focus on this kind of work, which is the Center for Health Security, the Nuclear Threat Initiative, the Future of Humanity Institute, the Center for the Study of Existential Risk. Um, but we also want to flag that there's this other really important way you can get relevant experience um, that can make you really impactful um, in this field. Um, and that's maybe sort of more implicit experience for things. Building career capital externally. Um, so this could be something like delving more into technical subjects that are of interest to you, possibly doing a PhD in a technical subject. Um, biosecurity and GCBR-focused biosecurity has really benefited from years of research um, from our sister fields. Um, so uh, fields like synthetic biology, fields like public health and epidemiology, fields like biodefense uh, and biosecurity um, from a defense angle. Um, and sort of getting experience in these kinds of fields can be really, really useful um, when you eventually want to focus uh, on problems that are GCVR specific. Um, this, could also be mean, this can also mean things like working at relevant government departments um, and working at grant making and sort of operational uh, like roles. Uh, there is like much more work than just research to be done um, in, in the GCVR space. Um, yeah, this is just to say that all of these things can lead to high impact biosecurity careers. So certainly don't just apply for positions um, looking for just the criteria that it has the acronym GCVR. Uh, in the title. Yeah. Cool. Then lastly, um, this is a slide just saying how to get involved. I will not go through this in detail. Maybe I'll leave like 10 seconds for you to take a photo of this and I like, go through it later on. Um, yeah, but there are basically more and more um, institutions working on this and they take different angles. Some do like um, very high level research, others do policy work, others work on um, technical solutions towards um, GCBRs. And then one final important note is that within biosecurity, um, it's just important to show initiative. Um, like GCBR-focused biosecurity is a very small field. There is like a limited amount of, no um, limited amount of senior individuals able to supervise um, more junior um, biosecurity folks. So one thing you should like really do is just like at events like this, like network, reach out to senior people and like read up on topics on your own and yeah, just like come up with ideas, like write something and then send it for feedback to more senior individuals. And this is lastly also um, like pretty crucial because the amount of official um, opportunities for more junior people to enter the field is still very limited. So it's really like important for you to just like yeah, show initiative and try to like push, um, like start your, um, yeah, start your path in this field, like, yeah, in, in, in a focused way, yeah. Cool, so this would be the end. Um, we are now like open for questions and discussion. And um, before doing this, we wanna give you like 20 seconds to maybe like save this link. There you will find a questionnaire um, for the talk. And at the end of the questionnaire, you will find our emails with which you can contact us. Thank you so much. Thank you for the great talk. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, whilst you fill in that bitly, also think about any further questions that you have and plug them into the app, into the live discussion tab on the event page, and then we'll.
kick, on in, uh, kick off in 30 seconds with the questions. Okay, um, so we'll start with a question by Karolina Sarek. So in the beginning, you said something along the lines of engineered pandemics can be more powerful because they do not have to comply with, the, with, with evolutionary limitations. Do you refer to pathogens specifications that predict the development of pandemics, e.g. virulence versus transmissibility trade-off that could be tweaked to make it both deadly and highly transmissible? Um, if yes, what is the rationale and um, yeah, explanation behind this claim? Uh, yeah, um, sort of as we mentioned, um, the thing that we um, are concerned about is um, that bad actors can have uh, more of an awareness of our current world today and can uh, engineer sort of more deliberately. Um, so this can be either through the actual engineering of the pathogen or through the release. Um, so they can uh, change the pathogen with an understanding of sort of uh, the current population um, and then also release this uh, in a way that's particularly dangerous. For example, um, not to get into this in too much detail, but um, uh, sort of releasing a pathogen uh, at multiple airport sites or something is much more concerning than a sort of like natural spillover uh, event because that can be contained much easier than something that is sort of happening, si happening simultaneously. Uh, at a lot of places. And that's also maybe why we're concerned about sort of deliberately engineered um, rather than accidental releases as well, because um, deliberately engineered things will also have this element of uh, release which can be uh, engineered, whereas accidental ones would maybe just happen at one site. Simon, do you have anything to add on that? No. Okay. <laughs> so obviously, COVID-19 has increased the world's perception of the risk that biological threats pose. How do you think the neglectedness of what we've been discussing has uh, changed in that light? Yeah, um, so I've actually been thinking about this myself because I, um, I decided myself to enter the biosecurity field after the pandemic started. And before doing that, I was like, okay, like this problem like seems solved. Like it's like completely obvious that pandemics, like by now it's like obvious what kind of damage pandemics can um, cause. But yeah, like throughout the pandemic, I've really updated towards like, okay, like we are still not taking this seriously. Um, yeah, so we, yeah, we just like see it in policy discussions where the budgets for pandemic preparedness are still really low. Um, we also see it in discussions about um, certain dangerous kinds of research where it's still not, um, there's like still no cost benefit analysis of doing a very dangerous research that could potentially cause pandemics. Um, and I think, yeah, so I still feel like this field is neglected. But I also think that like right now is a very good moment to enter the field because like people actually listen to you when you say, okay, pandemics are like a thing that happened one happened once every 100 years. This just happened, and like now is like a good moment to like prepare the world for the next one and like make sure it like doesn't cause as much damage damage as the current one. Great, thank you. Um, what do you think are some common misconceptions about working in biosecurity? Yeah, working in, what are common misconceptions in working in biosecurity? Um, I think there's some idea that um, we have a very firm grasp of what the most effective interventions are. I think this might be to some degree um, because of the parallel uh, in terms of concreteness um, to sort of AI interventions. Um, and though we have some idea of what is uh, useful to work on, I think there's a lot of work um, in sort of a bigger picture sense um, that we, we still need to figure out. Um, so I think maybe one of the most common mis misconceptions is, is that, that we have a really concrete idea of what the most effective interventions are and maybe one of the sort of big bottlenecks is that it's been difficult to sort of organize or just do this. Um, I, I don't think this is true. I think there's sort of like a broad range of risks um, that we want to be mitigating. 
um, and uh, therefore a broad range, range of approaches that we need. In your talk, you talked a lot about uh, risks to humans, human pathogens. Uh, what role does do risks to agriculture, to plants and animals pose in the GCBR space? And how much do you think about them? Um, yeah, I think this is something that's uh, considered, but it's definitely true that this is not as much attention is paid to this. Um, I think something I'm really interested in, but haven't had much time to look into, is sort of uh, multiplier effects. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a, a lot of considerations in terms of how robust our, our system should be, whether they're sort of um, our, our energy systems or our food systems. Um, and it's definitely the case that um, it's not just sort of infecting humans that can be really bad um, for, um, or, or lead to catastrophic risks. Um, it's definitely the case that sort of, um, you know, harming our food systems could also lead to pretty catastrophic um, sort of outcomes. Um, but yeah, this is certainly not something that I've spent much time and doing research on and is perhaps a neglected area. Um, but yeah, I, I guess, yeah, our, our focus is, is mostly on humans. Yeah, yeah, I also just like wanted to add like that is true, like there doesn't seem to be much research on this. And I think this is like true in general in biosecurity. There's like a lot of like research questions that are just like not answered because like people don't have time to look at them. Yeah, and this is like a, yeah, another good reason to like think about <laughs> entering the field. Yeah. Um. I think this is a quick question. What do you think, what are your probabilities regarding existential risk or global catastrophic events? Uh, it's just, uh, yeah, may, maybe not existential risk, but uh, at least the probability of such a global catastrophic event in the next few decades. Do you have a solid answer? Okay. Do you have like a, I, I, do, I certainly don't have a strong uh, probability for this. Um, I think that, um, I think it's important to think about the scale of the risk um, and also cases in which um, you think that these risks could arise, but something that's important in biosecurity is having an awareness that really mapping out the threat landscape can be very dangerous. Um, and this is maybe not something that we spend a lot of time focusing on um, because of the info hazards that it could pose. So it's important that we do this in sort of an abstract way, um, but also I think that sometimes these probabilities can be a little bit misleadingly concrete. Um, and so I don't... <laughs> I don't think it's super useful to spend too much time focusing on them. Um. Yeah, and maybe add on to that. Um, so John, we mentioned info hazards, which is this concept within biosecurity of certain information that could um, potentially be used by malicious actors to cause harm. And this is, yeah, like she said, a reason why we, for instance, don't do as much forecasting within biosecurity as in other fields, like technological forecasting. Because like if you do that, you have to like think in detail. Okay, like what technology would we need to like create this really bad pathogen that kills a lot of people? And that's like something we don't really want to explore. This is a question I like. Um, <laughs> have you heard of deep vision? And if so, could you please briefly explain what it is and what do you think about the associated risks? I have read a bit into it. Hmm? I have read a bit into it. I yeah, okay, cool. yeah, so Deep Vision is this um, basically like a really big research project that is currently being discussed in the US. Um, it, I think it has like potentially would be funded with like $100 million. And the idea is to um, sample viruses from a lot of different areas where there are frequent spillover events. And then the idea is to look at these sequences and think about, okay, like which of these pathogens could potentially like spill over in human populations and cause a pandemic. But like, yeah, like we in the like we in the biosecurity field are really not excited by this project because like at the end it will lead to like this list of pathogens from like the worst pathogen like downwards and like releasing those sequences. Yeah. So it seems like a yeah. Um it seems pretty dangerous. It's also just like more mundane. We have people like entering like more people entering regions where there are frequent spillover events, which then also increases the chance for having actual spillovers and having a natural pandemic. Yeah, something to note is that like a lot of sort of spillovers um, don't end in human to human transmission. So um, a virus or a pathogen that goes from sort of a wildlife animal then goes to a human can sometimes just end in that human. Um, so it's really hard to get a good sense of what pathogens um, and particularly viruses or any pathogens are going to jump and actually concretely cause disease um, in humans. And so um, there's some idea that like predicting viruses before they've jumped into humans or predicting pathogens before they jumped into humans is 
possibly like really, really difficult, if not impossible, uh, and therefore this uh, probably isn't the most cost-effective project. To briefly plug my own work, if you're interested in learning more about this, check out my recent preprint on the topic. <laughs> yes. But a related question is, what have you guys been working on recently and why are you excited about it? Yeah, um, so I can like briefly start. Um, so I'm currently working on a project. Um, so yeah, so we haven't explained this concept um, fully, but there's like dual certain like um, category of research called dual use research of concern, which is, um, Again, research is um, produced in like with good intentions, but can be used to cause harm. One example there is, for instance, some uh, research that was done on H5N1. H5N1 is like so some influenza strain that only spreads between um, birds. And there was some research done that made it spread between ferrets, which is like this uh, model organism for humans. And then within that research, um, there was also like um, detailed analysis of which, um, which like nucleotide changes lead to be this pathogen being transmissible among mammals. And so this could like potentially be used to then like design some novel pathogen to be like highly transmissible be between humans. And as of now, there's like no, it's like firstly it is unclear, um, so if any journals have policies against um, publishing such, such research. And um, second, it's also, it's also unclear um, what kind of policies would most help journals in, in addressing um, dual use research of concern. So in my, um, in my current research project, I'm, I will like, survey a lot of different life science journals, asking them um, what their policies are towards dual use research of concern, and will then, um, in collaboration with some others, give like, recommendations to journals for how they could improve this. Um, yeah, some of the research that I'm excited about, uh, Simon and I mentioned that um, some of the work that we're doing is in our early warning systems. Um, this really excites me. Um, so we're working on um, sort of uh, the nucleic acid observatory approach. Um, this is sort of looking for exponential increases of KMERS, which are basically genetic sequences um, in wastewater is sort of the idea currently. Um, and uh, what's really exciting about the system is that it's supposedly pathogen agnostic as well as passive, which means that hopefully it doesn't need too much maintenance um, out of wartime, so within peacetime. Um, yeah, something Simon mentioned is that uh, we can very quickly forget about crises once we're out, out of them. So creating systems that are resilient to this sort of um, short-term mem memory loss we can have as a society is something I'm really excited about. Um, I'm also sort of involved in a project where we're trying to figure out what exactly the kinds of technologies we would need um, in the next 10 years, particularly sequencing technologies, in order to enable these kinds of surveillance systems. So it's trying to break down the different steps of sequencing, so whether this is acquiring the sample, preparing the sample, actually finding out what's within the sample, what nucleotides are within the sample, uh, and, then and then analyzing it and seeing what are the physical possible constraints right now um, associated with these different steps, and then trying to map out um, sort of a roadmap um, of what we could possibly do um, in, in terms of developing sequencing technologies. So lots of different projects to work on, and you mentioned that the diversity in the projects and that are being developed is increasing. What do you think are some skill sets or some backgrounds that, that, that are needed that are maybe aren't the classical biology infectious disease background? Yeah. So one thing that comes to mind here, there was this um, recent post on the EA forum by Will Bradshaw, who also works on this nucleic acid observatory, and he called for more, um, like, like classical engineers to enter the field, also having more material scientists, because increasingly we actually like need to like think of like physical infrastructure that would be useful to guard against GCBRs, and there is currently there are currently very little people with that background within biosecurity. Yeah, this is certainly it's for the nucleic acid observatory. But there's a ton of other interventions where we're also missing sort of materials uh, and like physical engineers. This is also things like um, sort of strengthening our PPE um, and um, yeah, possibly even strengthening refuges and sort of ventilation systems um, and things like that. Um, yeah, another thing to mention, uh, I guess this is somewhat classical, but I just want to reinforce that having people from policy um, and philosophy backgrounds is sort of also important, or ethics backgrounds here is also important. Bioethics is sort of an, an important um, part of when we think of dual use research. Um, you know, we sort of need to integrate um, a lot of opinions here and having people who have an understanding of 
how this works translationally, um, so whether this thing is like good or right or um, whether it's what we should be doing and then how um, to implement it technically as well as how governments will come to implement it. I think especially when we're thinking about things like surveillance systems, um, I think surveillance systems need to be like almost truly global for them to be effective. One quick follow-up, are there any, what are concrete options for civil engineers to contribute to these efforts? I don't even know how to translate that into German, so. <laughs> um, concrete options to follow up in terms of? Uh, for helping with these risks, I, I imagine, so, and, and maybe there's a, how would you define civil engineer, whoever asked the question? <laughs> Oh, I guess yeah. the, the sort of, uh, to some degree there's like, um, structure design might be applicable in the sort of refuge design systems that we're interested in. Um, but I would also really recommend you to reach out to Will Bradshaw um, on the basis of the EA forum post. So he did explicitly say at the end of it that if you're an engineer and you're interested in working in biosecurity, um, that you should email him, which he, he sort of did drop there. Um, and so yeah, reaching out with your understanding and your experience in this, um, I think you'll have a really good uh, sort of, um, okay. yeah, explanation. To end on a high note, um, what are you most optimistic about with regard to tackling biosecurity risk? Yeah, so I'm currently quite excited by um, things happening within policy. So there, the discussions in the US are pretty healthy around like better governments of dual use research of concern. And I think if we focus on this and try to get this right, there could like be some like really useful new policies that um, yeah, like measurably lower the risk from um, dual use research of concern. Yeah, I'm. Um, yeah, I'm also really interested in uh, policy discussions and really excited about. Um, recently, um, Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins mentioned at a, a meeting at the, the bio of the Biological Weapons Convention uh, that uh, the U.S. might be interested in sort of um, helping with or uh, would, would uh, be excited in seeing new verification mechanisms um, of the Biological Weapons Convention, and I'm really excited in seeing what direction this goes. Thank you very much. Um, this is the end of this talk. The next talk that will be here is the importance of building EA communities at university. That will start in five minutes. To finish up, yeah, a big applause for our speakers. <laughs>